My name is Gaddy Conte George. I am the co creator, co producer, and co director of Black Community Mixtapes. I think audiences should watch Black Community Mixtapes because it gives you a different perspective of Canadian history um, from a community level, um, from showing new aspects of the Black Canadian communities um, in Canada, uh, varying perspectives, and done in, I think, a very fun and exciting way. So it's not your usual history series. Well, myself and Alison Duke, the other co-creator of the series, when we were um, developing the series, we were inspired by archives, the archives of Mr. Winston LaRose, who we um, previously did Mr. Jana Finch with, and he has this massive collection of uh, footage he shot over the past 50, 60 years, over 5,000 hours. Um, of archival footage and after Mr. Jane and Finch, others from the community approached us um, about having archival materials as well. So we thought, what a beautiful way to um, give new life to that footage, um, to put it in a series. And at the time we were watching a lot of like information, entertainment shows that were really fast paced, fast moving. And so we thought a great way to kind of activate the footage would be to kind of make it really fast, really, really fast paced um, and have it hosted, to have someone guide us along, um, giving context and more depth um, to the materials. And then also we threw in um, some really cool motion graphic design. Uh, we work with an amazing, talented, creative Ramon Charles. And he just, you know, able to sprinkle that on from development stage right through production um, to give that extra flavor that the series needed. And I think just a combination of the fast editing, you know, trying to use really dynamic footage and then the motion, gra motion graphic design, as well as set deck, I think all of that combined um, made it really dynamic and entertaining. We don't want to be trying to figure things out again in the next 20 years. We all have a role to play, collect, archive, and write about our black history so the information can be easily discovered in the future. The process, I mean, I think a lot of the topics that we chose for the episodes were kind of um, topics we wanted to explore um, black Canadian cultural history, not, not, and, or, and also tell these different elements of history through um, interesting um, and more accessible entry points. Everybody loves music and Canadian hip hop is, you know, I think a very exciting topic and a lot of aspects of it are unknown or, un or under celebrated. And, you know, Toronto Carnival is, you know, everyone loves Caravana or, or whatever you want to call it. And um, we thought it was a great way to talk about emancipation because people often don't make the connection between the two. Um, and so a lot of the different topics we thought were ways people love arts and, and culture. So we thought the entry point through the arts and the culture, but to tell historical stories, like through literature, we were able to talk about um, the history of immigration and migration and racist policies that Canada has a history of upholding. But the entry point is literature. So we just thought, you know, easy entry points that, you know, you're watching TV, it's entertaining, it's, um, but then you get to get to these little nuggets of information and history um, uh, through it all. So we definitely, in development, uh, we, did a lot of research on the different topics and the different aspects of history and which ones intersected and overlapped and kind of how could one lead to the other and then who were the people to tell that um, tell that story so like for example for hip-hop we thought the general approach is you go to the artists and we thought well do you know what what about the perspective of those who were bear witness to it so we thought it would be just excellent to have michael williams and master t VJs from Much Music, who did the very first um, shows on national television to highlight the Canadian hip hop industry and were gatekeepers, door openers for so much of our industry. And 
And then in addition to that, community radio. Hip hop flourished and grew so much on community radio. That was the go-to before the internet, before mainstream radio. The only place you could really find a lot of hip hop was in community radio stations. So who better to tell that story of, of hip hop and early hip hop than the DJs and hosts who um, put on these shows. So yeah, we really wanted to find people who had really different, maybe different than the usual suspects um, to tell these different stories. And then we just reached out to them and a lot of them were receptive because a lot of the times they're not the ones people go to to kind of honor or tell these aspects of history. For like Caravana, we interviewed carnival queens and costume makers. Uh, and we thought that would be a very interesting um, perspective as well, as well as others who kind of have, um, you know, this adjacentness to Carnival, like uh, Kwame Williams, a drummer who's been involved in um, Caravan over many, many years. So we just kind of really wanted to think about just who were involved on a community level, on a grassroots level, you know, hands getting messy right in there in these moments of history to really tell these stories of, of, of uh, and not just like being able to tell the story of something that they read or they studied, but they actually experienced. What exactly is Black Canadian history? And if it's not on the internet, does it even exist? My name is Cara Martin. I'm an emerging actress, singer, and filmmaker, born and raised in the 90s in Toronto, Canada. My parents are community activists from Jamaica and Trinidad. And all my life, I wanted to know more about our history and how it's connected to the global community. Cara Martin, the host of Black Community Mixtapes, um, is a gem. She originally um, came through our Oya Emerging Filmmakers program, which is a training program that we have for emerging black um, postgraduate filmmakers who are looking to find their way into the industry. So we provide networking opportunities, um, uh, skills development, professional development. And so Cara was in our very first cohort back in 2018. And she came in the pro into the program, um, you know, looking to learn more about becoming a filmmaker. But at the same time, we came to find out that she's an actress, she's a musician, a singer. So just like a triple threat. And so, um, uh, fast forward a few years, uh, we had our graduation for subsequent cohorts of our program. We asked Cara to be the host of those graduation ceremonies. And we just loved her presence, um, you know, on stage. And we thought, you know what, why don't we, um, you know, see how she fits for the host of the series. So when the series was in development and we shot a development sizzle reel, um, Cara was the host for that. And she just knocked it out of the park. She brought great creative energy, great youthful energy, you know, and so when we finished development and we were shopping around to the broadcasters, we really pushed for Cara. Um, you know, some wanted someone a little bit older uh, for the demographic for the series. And we really pushed because we thought her youthful energy was gonna be just the perfect touch that the series needed to really bring this, these historical moments um, to life. If Black Canadian history isn't available online or in a museum, will anyone ever know that it exists? Could it be that when you look at Black Canadian history more closely, the more things change, the more they stay the same? This is Black Community Mixtapes. I have to definitely give um, you know a big shout out to uh, my co-creator, Allison Duke, and our production designer, um, Chelsea Tong. They really worked to get the set down and, and the rest of the, the team that worked in the art department. The idea was we wanted a really dynamic, beautiful, vibrant set that had different aspects. So if you look carefully at the set, like if this one with Master T and Michael Williams, um, you see some Caravana or Carnival costumes uh, on the table there. There are different ar archival materials for people to interact with. You know, we bring some African influence with some African carvings and masks. Um, and then we have these TVs with the static. And those are really important for us to show because those represent the unspoken history, the names that are not mentioned, the people that have been lost to historical record because you know, our history isn't always documented properly. So we wanted to definitely pay homage to that. And that was our way of doing that. So you'll see that in every episode, at different angles, you'll see a TV that's um, that has the snow or just the, the static in there to represent that. And then like 
carnival costumes are so beautiful and vibrant in color, so we have a lot of that on set. Um, you know, throw in some plant life, you know, because life, you know, just wanted to bring it alive. We have records on the floor, you know, just different pieces of archival material. We have cameras, to, you know, um, video cameras, still cameras, old film cameras, just different materials just to really decorate the space, you know, and it's all surrounded by a black void. Um, so yeah, I think we just wanted to make something that was this dynamic and rich. So you're kind of looking, you watch it a second time, you might catch something new. And so we just kind of wanted, wanted that kind of playfulness in there as well. Um, well, well, we developed the series over two years. <laughs> and then we shot the episode in January. We, we shot, we started filming the episodes and then went into editing. So it took us probably about six, seven months to episode to edit all the episodes, but they kind of were all being edited kind of, you know, two at a time. And then we'd come back to one and move to the other. So I would say if we, to isolate one, maybe two or three months, I mean, we had to take the time um, to really massage them out, to make sure we're, uh, you know, telling the right parts of history and then having the right archival material. There was hours and hours of archival material to go through and to source and to find and then we find something and then you know we might find something new and then we want to replace it and so and then or we get something that you know we can't find the source or we can't clear and then so it has to be replaced so there was a lot of back and forth um, and it's a lot of refinement um, and it takes time to work with archival material and then also the fact checking of the historical aspect of it because we're telling history it's real it's true and we want to be accurate uh, so there's that aspect too so definitely i would say it would take at least two to three months full time um, per episode i think the most surprising part of the series was just the amount of work it takes to use archival material organize archival material, find the sources of the archival material, and clear it. That was a beast. I mean, if you watch the show, you can see how fast. We sometimes use a, a, a video or a photo for like less than a second, maybe 10 frames. And so, you know, add that up. We had, you know, some episodes, our EDL, our ed edit decision list, which is a list of everything that's used in the episode. Um, we'll have over 600, 800, items listed so imagine having to go through 600 items identify every single one identify every single source um, so that part was was a beast so we had to have definitely a really strong um, clearance team and research team to kind of work through all of that some of our teamwork is chase producers fona sudu and fola and a few other team members who really reached out to community members. I mean, the good thing is, um, Allison and I have both been working in community, making a lot of community-based projects over the past 20 years. So a lot of the times, people were people we were already familiar with, um, who we might have worked with in the past, or might have supported in the past through their projects, or they might have supported us. So um, it was a community effort. I think that kind of circle was our reference point, because a lot of these people were in the materials and we wanted the approach uh, for who we wanted to interview and feature was those who either lived these moments that we were mentioning or had archived it, filmed it, um, and had some kind of connection to it. So it was really community. And so it was either reaching into our Rolodexes or our, our team, you know, just doing a search and finding the people and then just reaching out to them and asking. Um, I think the difficult part was just people's availability if they could be available for a studio day. So there's many other people we wanted to feature in the series, but just the scheduling just didn't um, work out. Uh, but that, that was the process. I'd say one of the biggest challenges was just the depth of information and the cultural context. Not all, everyone from our team was from um, uh, the, a black, the black community, so there is um, a learning curve. Um, that shorthand wasn't always there to have that historical knowledge. Because a lot of uh, black Canadian history um, is hidden and is only and maybe only known by those who experienced it or those within the community or adjacent to the community that a lot of this was learning for a lot of our team members. So it was that level of education to understand the context. Why is that line important? Why is that image important? Who is that person, you know, from 30, 40 years ago that is no longer talked about now? So then there has to be that learning 
um, because as you're sifting through archival material, you might not have um, a name or you might sift through like an old VHS tape that's an hour long that might cover an event. And what I see and what my editors see might, see might be two different things because I might be aware of who are these people and why they're important. I remember a few years ago when we had our Emerging Filmmakers program working through some of this archival material, I remember there was like a banquet with reception and um, one of the young people made a note and like, man in suit. And I'm like, that's Lincoln Alexander. <laughs> like, you know, so if you were not around during that time, you might not be familiar with Lincoln Alexander, who he looks like, in a, or what he looks like when you're looking at a, a video that is not labeled to point that out to you. So then you might not think it's important, but then I might look through it and I, he's familiar to me. And so then, so like things like that took us a little bit longer because we had to make sure that we weren't missing anything in the materials, um, uh, just, just going through it. Black history in Canada is a reflection of our existence over time. So if we don't archive it, how's anybody gonna know anything about what has gone on within the timeline? As we go along, we have to be thinking about how to keep this archive alive, getting as much digitization and gathering of materials as possible, especially before things start to disintegrate and get lost or people pass away. And it's not until they're gone that we're like, yo, this is somebody to revere and think about their contributions. This was the vision for Black Community Mixtapes. You know, if we don't archive our materials, who will? And if we don't celebrate these people who um, are creating these moments of history, who are uh, trailblazers, then you know we don't want them to get lost to the historical record, and we need to make the efforts to do this before they're gone. You know, I think that's kind of the gist of it. They kind of it was like nail on the head. A lot of the times, I find um, you know I guess there's like-minded people, and we just kind of I mean th th that interview there was you know much longer than what would end up in the episode. So we did curate you know, different aspects of it to, to really kind of keep with the theme of the series and to really, uh, we also wanted to wrap up a lot of the episodes just talking about the importance of archive. And I think um, that soundbite from Motion kind of, and um, DJX, you know, kind of hit hit the nail on the head. Well, after Mr. Jane and Finch, and you know, that was a pretty successful documentary, won two Canadian Screen Awards from it. Um, and we did that with CBC. So we went back to CBC and developed Black Community Mixtapes with them uh, for I think a year or two years. And then when we finished the development and we were ready to go into production, um, they actually passed on the series. And so then we shopped it around now to other broadcasters because we wanted it to be with a broadcaster and be on a television station in Canada. And City TV uh, was very interested. And so then they came on board um, as our partner. Fortunately, City TV also has City TV Plus, which is their app. Um, for streaming, and then um, they also stream everything that's on City TV on Amazon Prime. So that was kind of part and parcel with the um, deal that we, we made with City TV. So that's how um, that came about. And then for the marketing of the series, we thought because we're because it's black community mixtapes, we're talking about mixtapes, which is a very 90s, a very hip hop thing. And Allison and I both come from that hip hop culture. We thought a great way to promote the series was to get everybody to do a drop. Um, and if you don't know what a drop is, a drop is normally for, you hear it on radio, where you know people identify them themselves and they say, what are they watching? So we asked everybody in the series, everybody we interviewed to say their name and to say that, you know, so like, for example, if it was me, I would say my name's Gaddy. When I'm not making documentaries, I'm watching Black Community Mixtapes. My name is Michael Williams. Master T coming your way. Make sure you watch the Black Community Mixtapes. Black Community Mixtapes. Me and T, we're gonna be there. You don't wanna miss it, baby. It was really, really fun to get a lot of people um, to do that because it's generally musicians or um, actors or actresses that do those kinds of things. But we're asking let, like George Eliot Clark, uh, you know, poet and professor to do a draw, you know. And so people had a lot of fun with it. And I think it was a great way to market the series because you easily get to showcase who's going to be in it. And then you get that identification and the, the whole reinforcement of the series. <laughs> 
Hi, I am George Elliot Clark. When I'm not writing poetry, I'm watching Black Community Mix Tapes. Hi, I'm Ida Sadu. When I'm not looking at my own tapes, you know what I'm watching at the top of my list? Black Community Mix Tapes. There you go. For me, getting into film production, um, I love the medium. I was kind of techie, but not really into like computer programming. I was kind of artsy, but you know, I, I can't really draw or do anything like that. And so for me, I, I, I started as a video editor. So it was a perfect mixture of doing something creative, but also with a technical um, aspect of it, um, uh, you know, with the editing software. So, uh, and then also for me, I thought to myself, so much of, of, of black communities and the black experience is um, not told through our perspective. And so much of that in the editing process can be stereotyped, misconstrued, and um, just misrepresented. And so I just thought there's so much power in the edit suite and there's so much power of just, you know, the order you put pictures in, um, how you juxtapose what someone says with the image you use, how that can twist someone's perspective or correct someone's perspective. And so um, that's that's why, that, that's what really drew me into the industry. I love nonfiction, I love documentary, and that kind of was definitely my lane. Um, you know, a part of me wanted to be a lawyer, so this is also my way of, you know, doing that social justice work. And um, and doing that activism work, and so that's kind of why why um, you know I love I love filmmaking, I love telling stories, I love you know love watching stories, and you know going to the cinema. So kind of was a perfect combination for me. My favorite role to play in the filmmaking process. Um, oh, it's so hard to choose. I would say I would say directing, directing because I get to kind of see something through, create that vision, and you know, work with a great team to kind of execute um, that vision, so yeah, definitely. A message I would have for you know, upcoming um, black women um, and that are working in the film industry, uh, especially in leadership roles, is just you know, kind of listen to your inner voice and um, don't shy away from difficult conversations. Don't shy away from being assertive. Uh, you know, we live in a world where, you know, we're seen in a negative light when we are assertive and when we have to stand up and speak up for ourselves. And I think that just needs to change and we can just, you know, let people feel how they need to feel, but just keep persevering and doing what you need to do to get, to, to get the work done. And, you know, there's strength in community and I think there's strength in working with others, especially others that respect you and have like-minded visions to kind of what you want to achieve in this industry. For the line interviewing next, well, obviously my business partner, Alison Duke, amazing filmmaker, a trailblazer in this industry. Uh, I think there are a lot of black women, women identified filmmakers in Canada that do not get enough light. And I think um, there are, are many that um, you should be highlighting. What's coming up next for me? Oya Media Group, we uh, have kind of had a very busy past few years. So Black Community Mixtapes is now out in the world. And coming up next, we have two feature documentaries. One is called Bam Bam, the story of Sister Nancy. Um, and that's going to be on Crave in the future, as well as uh, um, A Mother Apart, which is a co-production with the National Film Board of Canada. And that will be coming to um, a CBC documentary channel in the future. So um, look out for those. And you know, I'm also working on uh, um, another feature length documentary that's early in development. And um, yeah, so lots, lots of projects coming through the pipeline, but you know, Oya Media Group, that's what uh, we want to do, just continuing to, to tell you know, it's really amazing stories um, to share with the world. You're checking out Gaddy Conte George on The Line. <laughs>